Hi everyone. This is a little lecture about embellishing tones. Uh, so I want to get started by talking about terminology, actually. You've probably heard a couple of different words or you're likely to encounter a couple of different words for this phenomenon that we're going to be talking about. We're interested today in tones, notes, most often of a melody or maybe an accompaniment, we're interested in notes that are not in the prevailing chord. Um, so there are a couple things I want to say about that at first. Number one, I want to recall our discussion of harmonic rhythm and the discussions that we've had already of the process of harmonic analysis. Uh, the fact that we often want to come up with the simplest and most direct explanation for a musical phenomenon. And so embellishing tones are really closely tied in with that. Um, a lot of times you're going to want the, the explanation that sort of posits the least number of chord changes. You know, if you're presented with a measure and you are thinking about whether you want to say there are two chords in this measure or four chords, maybe, you know, is it every beat or every other beat that the chords change? Uh, considering certain tones to be embellishing tones, will be helpful in reducing the number of chords you have to say. Uh, it can also be helpful in you know, accounting for a lot of notes that are outside of chords. Embellishing tones are really, really common. You know, They kind of sound like they might be exotic phenomena, but actually they are incredibly common. They're everywhere in every type of music and every melody. Um, it's actually really difficult and sounds really artificial to compose something that has no embellishing tones at all. The second thing is the terms used. Uh, I'm using the word embellishing tones. A lot of textbooks these days tend to use that word, uh, but a lot of textbooks will also talk about non-chord tones. You know, that's a pretty direct term for what we're talking about. We're talking about chords that are not, or tones that are not in the chord. They might also say non-harmonic tones. This is kind of a, a maybe a fancier way to suggest the concept of non-chord tones, or maybe it suggests, you know, tones that are dissonant, you know, tones that are standing outside of the harmony. Um, and so I don't want to imply dissonance because an embellishing tone is not always dissonant. Uh, it frequently will be dissonant, but it's possible to have a chord that's a tone that is outside the prevailing chord, yet is doesn't really sound that dissonant. It might be dissonant against one note of the chord, for example. Um, I also like the idea of embellishing tones because it gets us to think in a really useful way in music theory. Um, we're not just slapping labels on chords. We're not just concerned with you know notes to the, the degree that they belong to chords. We're really trying to get down to how musical phenomena work. Um, so this kind of requires you to think about which tones or which chords are really playing an, ins an important structural role, you know, in expressing harmonic function of tonic or dominant, for example, and which notes are decorating those or embellishing them, as the term suggests. So you're kind of thinking in terms of um, structural notes that, that are sort of the framework, and then embellishing tones that are added along with those. It's not just that they aren't in the chord, it's that they're kind of decorating certain structural tones of a melody. And uh, thinking about how these decorative or embellishing tones are working is a really important aspect of today's lecture. So I just want to start with uh, a couple of the embellishing tones that we already know. You know, we've already encountered, uh, because of second species counterpoint and because of some of the examples we've done, we've already encountered um, passing tones, for instance, and neighboring tones. So we'll start with passing tones. And the passing tone creates a stepwise motion between two stable tones. So if you look at this illustration, you know, we have C in the bass. We maybe assume we have a C major chord. And E and C are in the chord. D is the passing tone that is not in that chord. So you can hear that these have a kind of rhythm to them with a stable tone in the chord, passing tone not in the chord, stable tone in the chord. Um, 
So they have a strong, weak, strong kind of a rhythm to them. And passing tones will frequently be unaccented. Um, we'll talk about accented versus unaccented a little, in a little bit. It's also possible, I'll point out, to fill in a fourth rather than a third. You know, the most common way you'll find a passing tone being used in a melody or a chorale harmonization or an exercise is you have a third, you want to fill it in. You've got a moment where you can stick an extra note in. Um, and that becomes a passing tone. Very frequently, it's not really seen here, a passing tone might be an instance where you use a shorter note value. If in your part writing, you have uh, quarter notes that are outlining a third, you could turn the first quarter note into an eighth note, stick an eighth note in there as a passing tone, and then land on your second chord tone as a quarter note. It's also possible to take the interval of a fourth and uh, fill that in with two passing tones. So for instance, if you think about that same C major chord and you want to go from G all the way up to C, you could play G, A, B, C, and A and B would both be passing tones. Another kind is the neighboring tone, and we've seen this again in second species counterpoint. Um, again, it's an unaccented tone that comes in between two more stable tones. So strong, weak, strong again. Instead of filling in the interval, neighboring tones are above or below the same note. So they're kind of used as a decoration when one voice is staying on the same note, which as you know can be very common in harmonizations. Um, a lot of times if you're trying to preserve as many common tones as you can, you get these instances where one line might be kind of boring um, because it's just doing the same note over and over again a couple times in a row, and throwing a passing tone might, or a neighboring tone, sorry, throwing a neighboring tone in might be an interesting way to make that line uh, a little more compelling. You can think of these as sort of decorating a single structural tone, in this case the E that's above the C, you know, forming the third of the chord, kind of gets a little decoration. I would say that upper neighbor notes tend to be a little bit more common than lower, um, but you really find both with a lot of frequency. And some music theorists will distinguish between an upper neighbor note and a lower neighbor note, uh, although we won't generally do that. We're just concerned with neighbor notes in general. So, to think about expanding our repertoire, expanding beyond these uh, embellishing tones that we already know, we're going to draw on these basic models a lot. You know, these basic models of sort of filling in an interval or decorating one that we already have, or decorating a single tone. Um, they're going to form the basis of a lot of what we talk about today. We'll also be interested not only in learning about the labels for all of these things, you know, it's important to be able to identify them, um, but it's not the be-all, end-all. You know, the point of a label is to help you understand how something is working. You know, we don't just want to say five on a chord. We need to understand that it's the dominant and it has certain tones that pull in certain ways towards the tonic, for example. That's how labels can help us to actually understand, to actually theorize about music. Uh, so I want you to be really conscious of a couple of things when we're talking about embellishing tones in this lecture. Those main qualities are going to be you want to know whether an embellishing tone is accented or non-accented. That is, in general, do they happen on a strong beat or do they happen on a weak beat? You know, this gives them a really different feeling. If you think about these embellishing tones we just mentioned, they're uh, both kind of weaker beat phenomena, but you can imagine how they would sound very different and we'll, we'll kind of see them in action. They'd sound very different if they fell right on the strong beat, right on the downbeat. We'll also want to know, do they involve movement by step or by leap or both in certain ways? Um, so that's going to be the thing that makes the difference in the classification is is frequently is this moving by step or by leap and which one of those things is first you know you can always think there are two events when you have an embellishing tone it's how do you get to that embellishing tone and how do you leave that embellishing tone or how does it resolve 
So first of all, let's look back at the neighboring note. And uh, I want to talk about a couple of common variations of the neighbor note. We have the double neighbor note, and we have the incomplete neighbor note. Um, so generally, neighbor notes are still going to be characterized by their essential stepwise motion and the fact that they're decorating a single original tone. Um, they're also still almost always unaccented. You know, the structural tone is the one that gets to be on the strong beat, and the double neighbor or the incomplete neighbors are the ones that are sort of around it in some way. So the double neighbor note um, is an embellishing tone that surrounds the structural tone, you know, the tone that it's embellishing. It can go in either order. You can have above and then below, or you can have below and then above. So here you've got the same sort of example. We've got a C major chord, we've got the E in the right hand, uh, and then we have a double neighbor note that goes up to F, down to D, and then back to E. So it sounds like this. I play it and maybe accent the chords so you can hear the meter a little bit stronger. Something like that. That's the double neighbor note. Another really important one is the incomplete neighbor note. Um, so the incomplete neighbor note is one that that resolves by step on one side, you know, or moves by step on one side, but has a leap on the other. So we call it incomplete because it's kind of disconnected from the note that it elaborates. Um, here you see that we leap from G down to D and then it resolves up to E. Uh, and so we think of this as an incomplete neighbor note because it's really elaborating the E. That's what we're saying when we say that it's an incomplete neighbor. It's that D is the neighboring note to E, and it just didn't have the first part of its usual event. We're kind of disconnecting it from that G. The G is incidental. Um, most frequently, incomplete neighbor notes are approached by leap and resolved by step. You know, we'll talk about a variation later that is approached by step and left by leap, but uh, most commonly, this is the configuration that you see. They're also usually unaccented. Um, and sort of tying into the discussion later, we kind of think of incomplete neighbor notes as a, a family of phenomena. You know, the idea of a note that neighbors a structural note is a really powerful one that can be applied in a couple of different ways. We talked about accented versus unaccented here. And the characteristics of accent can really have a big difference on the way you perceive something. So in this case, I'm going to show you an example from the song cycle Dichterliebe, which means poet's love. Uh, this is a song cycle by Robert Schumann, and it's a bunch of very closely related songs. Uh, but this one features really dramatic incidents of an accented passing tone, and uh, you're really going to be able to hear really clearly how this works and how it would be different uh, if it were unaccented. So I'm going to play it in two different ways for you. We have a very simple melody here. It's a little bit high, but it goes... Am leuchtenden Sommermorgen. You know, if I play it without singing here, it goes... And that A on the downbeat is the accented passing tone. Because, in terms of the harmony, we're over a B-flat chord here, so I'm not going to play it exactly the way that it's written, but it's something like... So you can hear really strongly, as the chord changes, that's the moment when the embellishing tone arrives. because it's very dissonant. The A natural against the E flat is an augmented fourth um, that then resolves down to a nice consonant major third. 
And you can just imagine how this would sound very different. You know, this was an intentional choice on Schumann's part because it sounds very different if I maybe cram the, the A natural in earlier. So something, uh, a version of the song that would go like this maybe. You know, not only is the text setting a little bit weird, you know, Morgan is the accented syllable and I made it Zama Morgan uh, is a little strange, but the dissonance is a lot less dramatic and a lot less expressive. Uh, it almost it almost floats by without you really noticing it. Let me play it again. Um, you know, if you ignore the text setting awkwardness and just listen to the music. The unaccented version is a lot less dramatic and a lot less expressive. So really, accented passing tones can be heard as, as distinctive phenomena that have a lot more affective weight to them than unaccented passing tones. So some subsets of the incomplete neighboring tone get special labels based on certain characteristics. So the most important one of these is the appoggiatura, this, uh, this big Italian word, two Ps and two Gs. The appoggiatura is a, is a really expressive, it's a dramatic embellishing tone. It's my favorite embellishing tone. You know, it's kind of nerdy to have a favorite, but uh, the appoggiatura is definitely my favorite. The appoggiatura is approached by an upward leap. It's a leap up to the dissonant note that then resolves down by step. Um, and the appoggiatura is accented. It falls on a strong beat. It might mean in this case, for example, that the appoggiatura lands on beat three, resolves on the and of three, lands on beat four, resolves uh, on the and of beat four. Let me see if I can play this for you to give you a little sense in my out of tune office piano. So, so this bass line is actually kind of, you know, moving us from if maybe it's a G chord up there to C. And then it's going to land on C. But it's going to be decorated here. That C and the E in the second half of the measure are going to be decorated with appoggiaturas that make it sound like this. downbeat notes are the decoration. The chord tones are simply but the appoggiaturas land on the downbeat and they make this very uh, very beautiful and very expressive. You might should even accent that a bit more to say uh, something like that. Our second example is the appoggiatura. Um, so talking about appoggiaturas is a good place to put in a second musical example. Um, this one is also from Schumann's Dichterliebe. This is actually from the very first song of Dichterliebe. It's called Im wunderschönen Monat Mai, in the wonderful month of May. Um, and this is sort of, this is the second half of the first phrase. Um, we've gone in wunderschönen Monat Mai, aus alle Knopfen spreng, uh, sprengen, something like no, no, Ospen sprengen. There you go. So the third phrase of the piece is this one. And it's a little bit tricky. Um, I'm going to do a, a sort of reduced version of it. It goes. a slightly reduced version of it that goes like this. So this 
passage is a little tricky, but I'm going to do a reversed, uh, a reduced version that goes a little bit like this. There's an appoggiatura. So on both of these downbeats, Herzen, um, heart, da ist in meinem Herzen, in my heart, lands in the downbeat with this painful appoggiatura, die Liebe aufgegangen. Um, both of them here are, have these very expressive upward appoggiaturas. Um, so we land on a B minor chord first, and you've got the leap up to E. Then you've got... So very dramatic in both cases here. Um, and you can imagine, just like with the first example, that if I made these unaccented, you know, they would no longer be appoggiaturas. They would be, uh, in the case of, of Herzen at least, and I think, yeah, Gagangan as well, they would actually be just sevenths. You know, it's in that chord from the previous beat. You know, Herzen is the seventh of that F-sharp uh, minor, uh, that F-sharp seven chord, F-sharp dominant seventh. Um, so it would actually go something like... less dramatic if it's part of this landing on the downbeat. Um, the E loses all of its charge that way. Same thing here. Barring a mistake, you know, you can hear it again. It sort of loses all its teeth and it just has, uh, it just is a nice, pleasant little tune. You really need to have the pain. Uh, so that's sort of the expressive potential of the appoggiatura. It can be really dramatic and can really lend uh, some emotion to a note if there's something that you really want to bring out in a composition. An escape tone is another kind of incomplete neighbor note. I wouldn't think of escape tones as being all that uh, common, but they are you know, important to know about, and there might be notes that you can't explain except as an escape tone. An escape tone is sort of the reverse of what I said was the usual arrangement for an incomplete neighbor. An escape tone is when you approach your embellishing tone by step, as, for example, E goes up to F there, D goes up to E, and then you leave it by a leap. So E steps up to F, and then we leap from F to D, and D is a chord tone, you know, against the F there in the bass, and then um, E is the escape tone. You step up to E, leap down to C. So that stands, that sounds something like this. name that Disney movie, Beauty and the Beast quote. Um, so escape tones are also unaccented. They're sort of these extra embellishing tones. If you look at this structurally G up to E, F up to D, E up to C, these are parallel sixths. You know, it's a first species counterpoint phenomenon that's being decorated with additional non-accented notes. Um, and just like first species counterpoint, or second species counterpoint more specifically, um, your step and your leap are going to be opposite directions. You know, in this case, we're stepping upwards and then we're leaping downwards. Um, so they sort of are prepared and resolved in this very familiar way that we remember from counterpoint. All right. Our next kind of embellishing tone is the anticipation. We're going to look at two very closely related embellishing tones that both involve arriving too early. 
So the anticipation is a stable tone that arrives a little bit too early for its chords. You have to think of the, uh, the anticipation as belonging to the next chord. And this should be a very familiar melodic gesture. It's something that happens really often at um, the ends of phrases. You know, cadences happen this way. Melodies end this way very frequently. Um, so for example, here you've got G in the bass going down to C, and you've got the leading tone here. And that little decoration, that arrival before the beat, before the bass note lands is uh, that was your anticipation, the eighth note there. Could happen in the other direction very easily. And really, you know, it's kind of a, a really clear gesture, something like. You know, it's something that really obviously points you towards a final cadence. Um, has this sense of finality, has this sense of kind of settling down. It's a very comforting kind of embellishing tone, you know. The anticipation is it, its own note here, almost always. Da, da, da. You know, it's, it's articulated, it's a little bit separated. Um, it's meant to be heard as, as uh, you know, anticipating the next chord, for lack of a better word. Um, it's very closely related to another embellishing tone called the syncopation. So syncopation broadly is a, is a much broader concept than just a non-harmonic tone. You know, syncopation is the idea of a note or an accent that, if, that arrives off the beat. You know, we say something is syncopated if it's sort of more oriented towards upbeats than it is towards downbeats. So if you have like a tempo, like a bum, 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 ba, 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 something like that is a syncopated figure. It's oriented towards the upbeats. It's accenting the upbeats uh, in a way that can sometimes produce a little bit of tension or it can produce a little bit of surprise or energy uh, in the way that it accents a weak beat or a weak part of the beat. A syncopation as an embellishing tone is specifically an accented note since it gets, you know, emphasis and it lands on an ordinarily unaccented beat. So here you see the circled note. Uh, you've got baby, baby, baby light here. Um, that circled one is the syncopation that we're thinking about. You know, several of these are syncopated. The second bay, actually, yeah, the second and the third time you have the syllable baby. Um, those are both syncopated, but only the circled one is a syncopation, you know, embellishing tone because it's not in the chord. Just like the anticipation, it's pointing ahead to the chord that's about to arrive on the downbeat. Um, and it's usually tied across the beat. Remember, the anticipation was articulated. It was a separate note, the ba, 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 or ti, do, do. Um, syncopation usually is held across. You know, it arrives before it's supposed to arrive, but then it's held on in the same note, and you don't get an attack on the downbeat. So finally is the suspension. And the suspension is sort of the opposite of the previous ones in the sense that a suspension is hanging on to a note after it becomes dissonant and then leaving it and letting it resolve to uh, the consonant note. We won't talk a lot about suspensions because there are, you know, there are some rules to them and they're actually the basis of fourth species counterpoint. So in the spring, when you take theory two, you'll hear a lot more about suspensions and you'll write a lot of them. They have, you know, certain, certain ways that they can resolve because they can only go to certain kinds of intervals and things like this. But this is a legal suspension. Um, that I'll show you. So, for example, we see in the bass something like four, five, one. You know, it's a cadential figure, which is a likely place for a suspension to happen. Um, and you can kind of think of this as decorating, you know, F and C to the leading tone over G. And instead, you hang on to C and let it become dissonant. So.
Sometimes they're literally held over, or sometimes, like this example, they're re-articulated. So, suspensions are interesting because they're kind of related to some of the other non-chord tones. They're a little bit related to um, appoggiaturas. You know, if you imagine leaping up to that note instead of holding it over, um, you could think of how it's related to the appoggiatura, because both of them tend to happen on strong beats. You could also think of it as being related to an accented passing tone. If you had, for example, D instead of C over F, we could hear this as an accented passing tone. It would go like this. So suspensions are kind of related to those other uh, forms of embellishing tone. The important thing about a suspension is that it's prepared as a consonance. That C there is a consonant note and it's held over as the other voice changes. So you can think of a suspension as having three different phases. The preparation, which is consonant here as it's part of a chord tone. Then the suspension itself, the circled note. The other voice moves against it and makes it dissonant. So you hang on to that note and let it become dissonant and then it resolves. So preparation, suspension, resolution. All three parts have to be there for it to be a suspension. Um, and if, it, if they're not all there, then it's some other kind of embellishing tone. So that's really all I have for the moment. Um, this is a little bit shorter than a regular lecture, but I hope it gets the idea across. Um, we're going to keep talking about embellishing tones as we go throughout the semester, but I thought that this was a really good place to have this lecture because it lets you uh, have a little bit of a reference to go back to as you're writing your recitative projects. Um, so I'd encourage you definitely to think about how you can use these uh, embellishing tones to create some interest in your own project. You know, you're writing very simple harmonic progressions for the recitatives, you know, often starting on an inverted tonic chord in 6-3 position, maybe going to an in-between in chord like a predominant, and then pretty much dominant tonic. Very simple, short phrase that expresses one or two lines of text. But you can really spice that up if you have, you know, certain meaning that you want to accent. You can definitely draw upon things like accented passing tones or suspensions or appoggiaturas to give that text a little bit of interest. It might be sincere dramatic interest. It might be ironic, you know, if you're choosing to take the comedic route with your recitative. But I'd encourage you to think about how you can use these in your composition assignments. And as we go on through uh, both our analysis assignments, uh, we'll need to use embellishing tones. As I said, it's very rare to find real examples of music that have no embellishing tones in them. So knowing about these really expands the repertoire of what we can deal with and what we can talk about. And then finally, as we're doing part writing, we'll start to look out for places where we can, you know, fill in intervals with passing tones or add some interest and drama to a line with an appoggiatura, for example. So we'll carry these ideas forward all the way through the rest of the semester. Thanks, and have a great day.